is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we are getting ready for the biggest week of college football so far. We got LSU versus Alabama, Minnesota versus Penn State. We're going to break it all down with Rufus Peabody of Massey Peabody today to get you set from a betting perspective for College Football Week 11. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Fang of the Power Rangers. Com. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank Ed. We got to see the first edition of the college football playoff rankings last night. Uh, how are you doing? And then reactions to that. I'm doing great. And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I, th- I thought it was both interesting and correct that Minnesota was as low as 17th. Uh, yeah. That was about the only thing that kind of got me to uh, get on Twitter and, and make a comment about. <laughs> uh, I also thought it was interesting that Clemson's out at this point. But yeah. Um, you know, honestly, that doesn't really matter. There's a lot right. of things that are going to shake out. I mean, you have two SEC teams ahead of them. Uh, I think if either of those teams are at one loss, it's it's an interesting conversation between them. Right. Um, but, you know, I mean, Clemson's not had the, the best beginning of the season. Uh, that's potentially by design because I know Dabo likes to, to get his guys in. Right. Um, I think Trevor Lawrence is probably having a little bit of a hangover. Uh, after being so dominant last year and not really having to worry about the NFL draft because he's only in his second year there at Clemson, uh, I think they'll I think they'll get it together. Um, you know, and then in the Pac-12's got to be thrilled to have two teams, right? Uh, and some, you know, a team in contention would be great. They actually got two, right? So if both of those teams can reach their championship game with one loss. I think, I mean, they're at least in the conversation. Not saying that they're going to make the Final Four. Right. Uh, but they're at least in the conversation with a one loss conference champ. And you look at the teams ahead of Clemson, going back to them, like n- those teams aren't going to win out. Like they can't because right. LSU plays Alabama, Ohio State plays Penn State. So, like they statistically cannot win out. Clemson right. probably will. So, like, it's not even a concern. I think it more so is a statement about their seeding once we get to the playoff. Like, the odds of them being the one seed, I would say, are very, very low now. And that does matter because it it will influence who they play in uh, the first game. But I think that there's no real concern for them there. I agree with your thoughts on Minnesota where, like, it was kind of surprising to see them be 17, but not unjustified. Uh, We're going to talk with Rufus about that, but I I think that – it makes sense, and to me, what that said was that they are weighing factors around games, not just strength of schedule, but factors around them, because Minnesota's played a lot of non-starting quarterbacks, and I think that that does matter. So I think that that was, that was very interesting uh, as far as their ranking. And it's yeah, interesting absolutely. to see how they play this weekend, too, for sure, as we'll see them <laughs> play game. Penn State. Yeah, big, big game. We're going to break it down with Rufus Peabody. Uh, he is of Massey Peabody. You can find his work, Massey-Peabody.com. We're going to talk about the college football playoffs. Actually, Massey Peabody has um, rankings and a model that helps project out the odds that a team goes to the playoff. And we're going to talk to Rufus about the difficulties in making a model like that. Ned, I know that you don't have one public, but you said that you were creating one, just kind of tinkering around with it. But like, I can't imagine that's an easy task at all. Um, well, I, you know, to toot my own horn a little bit, like I actually came <laughs> up with this like the first year of the playoff. Okay. Uh, I did, I did it with Bleacher Report. So, you know, Rufus and, and Cade Massey there, they were definitely late to the game. <laughs> Just kidding, Rufus. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing and, <clears throat> you know, I do it very differently from what they do. Uh, okay. usually have pretty much the same answer. Um, but it's, um, yeah, no, it's definitely interesting to look at and, uh, be, you know, we can, we can talk about it a little bit more later in the show. Absolutely. We sure will. We'll talk with Rufus. Uh, find Rufus on Twitter at Rufus Peabody. He's a pro spor- sports better, not just talking about college football, but everything. Uh, Rufus is there. Find his insights on Twitter there. We'll also have our NFL preview coming up later this week. So make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Wherever you listen, you can find us. And while you're there on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review as well, because those do help us out a ton. Thank you to those of you who have already done so. Before I bring in Rufus, talk week 11 of college football. We got to go back to last week where we went down uh, Ed's numbers. And Ed, you did pretty well. So let's go back at what Ed's numbers said for week 10 of college football. Covering the past. 
All right, so last week we wanted to dive into Ed's uh, adjusted success rate numbers and talk about the formulation of those numbers, what they mean, why they are relevant. And we went through the picks of Ed, and Ed did really well. Uh, He wanted SMU plus six against Memphis and actually wound up being a push there. Uh, You said six was just high enough to get you to bite, and it wound up being exactly six. So uh, the number's pretty accurate there. Wait, hold on. A little bit of a backdoor there. Um, yeah. because SMU scored late. and But the most interesting part about that was they were up 14. Right. I'm almost asleep. Um, <laughs> they score a touchdown, but then they go for two. Yeah. And that is the right play when you are down eight and Correct. you need a touchdown to play. So essentially, basically, like, if you make it, then you can kick an extra point to win the game. Right. If you don't, you still know that, then you know that you have to go for two the next time. And it just makes a lot more sense than kicking, kicking an extra point. So I kind of woke up. Um, you know, or or at least, uh, you know, turned my attention away from my glass of wine and got on Twitter and, and tweeted <laughs> about that. And it was actually very, got a really good response for 11 p.m. on a Saturday night right. of people arguing, yes, this is, yes, that's right. No, that's wrong. Um, but it, it is the right play. Um, and, you know, Kevin Cole's done some work on that. He has a flow chart. I was going to mention that. He has a flow, chart, flow chart on Twitter. If you look at his, like, yeah. his media section on Twitter, you'll see a flow chart. And it just shows the logic and the decision-making. And I think it's even different too when it's an offense as good as SMU's because we're assuming right. their odds of making a two-point conversion are 50%. For right. SMU, it's probably a bit higher than that. Well, and especially the way that game went, right? Yeah. I mean, neither offense was having much of an issue. No. Um, so the odds are even more in your favor. And then obviously, if you're betting the game and it pushes at six, no complaints there at all. Absolutely. And the other two you won. Uh, you wanted Utah minus three and a half. They did trail entering the fourth quarter, uh, but they came back and... They kind of kicked some butt in the fourth quarter. Yeah. They got the win, and they covered. And that was despite Washington getting a touchdown late to make it actually closer than it really was. So I think Utah, they got love from the committee as they are uh, currently in eighth. But I think that's justified, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I think Utah's the best team in the Pac-12. That's what my numbers say. Um, I still think Washington is a good football team. Like, that, they're not – That that's not – Right. A Washington State or a Cal out there. That's like, you know, a program that has been to the top, uh, still recruiting well. And I think a team that's really going to bounce back, maybe not this year, but, you know, don't don't count them out going in the future. And I felt like Utah really dominated that game. Um, So you you could kind of see what uh, my numbers were saying there. So that was nice. Washington was tight against Oregon. They were tight against Utah. And those are the number and number seven and eight teams in the college football playoff rankings. So Utah, I would agree is going to be a team we're going to be talking about uh, in future years. You mentioned Kansas State minus six and a half against Kansas, and they obliterated them. So easy cover there for Kansas State. Any thoughts on that game? Yeah, well, I mean, I watched the market go, what, two, three points in the other way against me? It closed at minus seven and a half, or uh, at uh, minus five and a half, sorry. So I, I think it, it got down. Point. I think okay. it got down further. Okay. I think I saw a minus four at okay. some point. I was like, what the, what the... <laughs> Um, but I, I think, um, I don't know. You obviously want the market to go your way in general. Right. Um, but because you're getting free points at that point. Yeah. Well, and, and like, and, and, uh, but I gotta say it was pretty good to, to watch them so emphatically win, even though the market, uh, disagreed with me. Uh, not, not often that you get to be like, get to, to beat the wisdom of the markets. Cause that's obviously very hard. Uh, and the other thing is, um, you know, I mean, when I talked about that game, uh, I talked about success rate calculations and I think we should just stop talking about success rate for the rest of the show for the next 10 years that we do it, because maybe we'll just keep that to ourselves. Okay. <laughs> Ed will keep it to himself. I will cry in a corner and we'll all be fine. Uh, you did really well. I did not. And it was very frustrating. It was Halloween. I wanted Baylor minus 18 against West Virginia They won by three and actually almost lost that game. Uh, But Baylor outgained West Virginia 453 to 219 and almost lost that game. If they had lost that game, I would have gone nuts. Baylor lost two fumbles in West Virginia territory. They were stuffed at the goal line, turned it over on downs. I was uh, was about to go to bed and I was following that game on my phone. And they had it at the two. It was like second and goal. And they were up 14 to seven. I was like, okay, cool. They're going to be at 21 to seven and a half. That's fine. I feel good about this. And I woke up. You went to bed early. Yeah, I'm old. I can't. <laughs> I was in at 10 on Halloween, which means I'm just checked out. Like 
socially checked out. Um, but I checked it and it was, uh, I was like, okay, cool. 21-17. Awesome. They didn't get to 21 for the entire game because they got stuffed. So I was not close to being right. They could have lost that game very easily if not for a block, a block field goal. Yeah. But I also don't feel that bad about it from a process perspective. Uh, I don't know. What do you feel about that? Like where you get a game where it doesn't even come close to covering, but the yardage was still like heavily in your favor. Yeah. Do you I mean, feel good about that still? I mean, you know, I mean, it all, it all depends, right? I mean, there's, um, it all depends. It all depends on the underlying metrics. It depends on how it looked on yeah. the field. Um, I mean, there's a lot of factors, you know, I mean, when you look at, you know, just for example, the Ohio State Michigan game last year where Michigan got thrashed, um, you know, it was a lot. Obviously, there was a lot of big plays or a lot of breakdowns in the Michigan defense. Um, but by success rate, it was pretty close. I mean, Ohio State was still definitely the better team. And there's yeah. no way that Michigan should have won that game. So I, that one doesn't feel like one where you can justify it after the fact just by saying success rate. Right, but, right. You know, but we also know that that's what's going to be. Damn, I'm talking about it again, Jim. <laughs> Shit, I Bottle it stop. up. Bottle anyway, it up. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not really a justification for it, but we do know that success rate's the best projecting forward. So, uh, you know, it's always a case by case basis. Yeah. Uh, if Baylor could score in the red zone, I'd be a happy man. They can't. I'm not. So we're going to leave that one in the past. Hopefully Rufus can give us some better picks than what I gave last week. We'll talk to him in just one second. But first, if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia or Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Let's bring on Rufus Peabody now of Massey Peabody. Follow Rufus on Twitter at Rufus Peabody. He is a pro sports better. You can find all of his numbers at Massey Peabody.com. We're going to break down the college football playoff rankings and take a look ahead at what should be a thrilling week 11 across college football. Covering the present. Let's welcome Rufus Peabody into covering the spread. Rufus, you've got a jam-packed schedule this time of year, so I really appreciate you taking some time to swing by here to talk some college football. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, and I always enjoy talking college football. I don't, I don't do it enough. And it's a pretty good time to have you on because last night the playoff committee just released their first rankings of the year. You over at Massey Peabody have been doing some work around these rankings. So before we dive into the model that you have and kind of all the factors that go into trying to predict how a committee will select things, what was your initial takeaway from those rankings last night? So I actually just saw them this morning and I was a little bit surprised. Um, I I think everybody thought, or most people thought, LSU would be the number one team. We actually did have Ohio State at number one. Mm -hmm. I thought that, in, in, I thought that Clemson probably would get the nod at number four, but we had it as a coin toss basically between Clemson and Penn State, depending on how. And I tweeted about this. Um, depending on what you think, uh, the, how how you think the committee values a defending champion. And generally, in the past, and obviously this is. We don't have a huge sample size here because what this is what the fifth or sixth right. season of, of the college football playoff mm -hmm. um, in the past that a defending champ has kind of gotten a little bit of a boost in sort of these close calls. And so um, we use sort of an ensemble model. And so Clemson actually edged out Penn State, but it, it's like a 50.3 percent chance thing in, in our model. So Penn State got that nod there. So that was I mean, the top four is all that I mean, that top four is what people are focusing on. But. What I was really surprised about was where they put Baylor in Minnesota, where we whiffed in a big way on those on those teams. And why do you think that was? Um, because I think that when you look at Minnesota, you can look at, you know, facing a lot of backup quarterbacks and maybe the committee's accounting for that. But when you're looking back at the reasons that may have led to the deviations for Baylor and Minnesota, what sticks out to you as being potential explainers for where the committee put them? Well, I think the biggest thing there is the fact that the committee actually seems to be, or in this particular instance, seem to value how well a team is actually played, like how good a team is, um, much more than they did in the past. In fact, when when you look at sort of the Massey Peabody in-season rating, which it only uses a prior to control for strength of schedule, um, that rating had three t more than three times as much weight in, in this first installment of the college football playoff ratings um, implicitly uh, than it has in historically. So 
normally we, we, we think measured such as strength of record are a little bit more important, which is a measure that, that it says basically given um, it, it's the likelihood that an average top 25 team would have as good or better a record as the particular team if they played that same schedule. So, you know, Ohio, Ohio State's number two in that metric. They're at 15 percent. LSU's number one at 13 percent. Baylor is number five at 25 percent because they've beaten everybody they played. Minnesota, number 10 at 49 percent. So that tells you about their strength of schedule there a little bit. But um, actually, Baylor and Minnesota have pretty similar strength of schedules. Baylor's 92nd and Minnesota's 103rd. But the strength of record gets into the fact that, like, you know, it's the not not every 92 is the same. You could have, mm-hmm. I mean, if, if you're playing like Arkansas or let's say a Jacksonville State or Southeast Missouri State or one of these, you know, FCS teams or if you play a UMass type team, like if you're favored by four, it doesn't really much matter if you're favored by 40 or by 43 or by you know 32 in a particular in a game right i mean that's right. going to be a win but what matters is is more in the strength of record is those tough games and so sure. um so basically baylor and minnesota we gave them too much credit for being undefeated that's basically what it comes down to and and we didn't penalize them enough for being inferior teams to a lot of the teams that we had them slotted above and that's based on what we predicted the committee's behavior would be mm-hmm based on previous years but yeah. it's and it, it shows what a tough task this is too especially given the fact that it's a different committee every year these aren't <laughs> the same people as last year so yeah. in fact in, in what we do is every year we actually weight the current season much higher like three times higher than than previous seasons just because of that sure. there's no where did i come up with that number three i don't know but it's <laughs> Um, so, but I, I really enjoy this though. It's fun. It's sort of, I don't gamble on it or anything like that, but if you had, you could have bet on, on Ohio state at plus 20, 225 to be number one, somebody pointed out, um, <laughs> probably say like $20 dollars bet online, but I don't bet on this, but it's, it's just kind of a fun, fun project. So Rufus, I, I think it's always going to be difficult to predict human behavior like that. Um, I think it's easier to actually project given the human behavior, how everything's going to uh, go out forward because we know how strong your college football model is. Uh, anything interesting in terms of odds to make a playoff or odds to win a national title after this first committee rankings? So m- I'm not sophisticated enough where I'm using these committee rankings to uh, impact my my. Well, I guess it, it is going to impact my future model. Um, but but I'm not saying okay, m- Michigan or not Michigan. Um, Minnesota is number 17, so they basically this you know this hurts their chances whatever amount. So I'm still running it based off of the same thing. Um, okay. Cause I think when we get to the end, I think it's, it's things are different when we get to the end of the season. Um, okay. you know, Great. I think, I don't know if you agree, but I think if Minnesota runs the table, they beat Ohio state or Penn state in the big 10 championship game. I don't think politically there's any way they can be left out like Agreed. an undefeated big 10 champion. No. Um, but what's the likelihood of that though? Right. So, uh, for no, um, <laughs> one per- point, Two point seven percent. Okay. Two point seven. There you go. Two point seven percent chance that they win. That out. includes the title game. That includes the title game. Interesting. That, or, I mean, that includes the conference championship game. That's not winning the national championship or anything. That's just right, right, right. Sorry, conference. So that would include, and in, you know, in your model, playing in Ohio State, playing at Penn State in that conference championship game. Okay. It would. It would. And, and Baylor's even less likely at one point one percent. So oh. what's interesting in, in this is, is that Minnesota and Baylor both had very easy schedules so far. But if you look at the remaining schedules, they re, they rank among the toughest of okay. these. Yeah. Um, in fact, actually, I have Minnesota as the toughest uh, remaining schedule of the teams in the conversation. Interesting. Okay. And obviously, this model is has to be semi new because the college football playoff is semi new. What was that process like trying to build out that model? As you said, there are a lot of factors. It's a small sample. There's a new committee every year. What was the process like for you trying to build that out with all those weird competing factors all, all in play there? Well, initially I tried to build out something to bet on college football futures. So yeah. I remember the first year I did it, I, I was building it out during the year and kind of, it, it was more about, it was sort of rules. I was like, okay, we'll slot, you know, we'll slot we had sort of tiers and we'd say okay um it, it actually it did we, we used individual teams you say okay well a one a one loss washington will 
we'll think we'll always get in above a you know two loss USC or something like that. And so right. so it was it was much more of an ad hoc thing there. And and then we actually once we had more data, uh, then we actually started building something. And the thing is, we're what what we're trying to do is use thing um, use our metrics or metrics that come out of our numbers that we think makes sense logically. So it, it's obviously we know that the committee is not using Massey Peabody numbers. They're not um, they're they're not using the same strength of record metric I'm using, right. but we think that we think that it's a good proxy for for the strength of a team and for how good the resume is. And so we it, we basically are blending a lot of these things and running a, a bunch of different models because we don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things that are that are pretty similar. For example, a team's strength of record, um, which I explained before, is very similar to their surplus wins, which is how many wins above expectation uh, for a top 25 team playing that schedule they would have. And and um, and and so it's kind of just blending all these together. And and obviously I think predicting predicting it at this point is much more difficult than predicting it at the end of the season. But luckily for the future stuff, all I really care about is at the end of the season. But I think one of the really difficult things is figuring out how it how much a conference championship matters. And that's something that I think is varied from year to year based on the committee. I mean I, I think the one year Ohio State made it, I think they that was here. They got blown out by Virginia Tech early in the season, and they right. got in, I believe, despite not. Did they win their conference? They won their conference that year. Okay. I think it was a different was year the, where they they had the the win over Oklahoma, right? But then Penn State won the East, so but they got in over Penn State. Yeah. So so some years you have you have things like that, but um, I mean I think this year it's going to be particularly relevant given what we have with well I guess with the Big Twelve. Um, Essentially, the Pac-12 and the SEC. So, I think the LSU, the loser of LSU, Alabama, is that team still? If they win out the rest of the way and don't even make their own, they don't. If they don't even make their own conference championship game, are they still right. in? I think if it's if it's LSU, if LSU loses to Alabama, I have them as a 68% chance of getting in as a one loss hmm. um, if, if they win out the rest of the way. Whereas I only have Alabama 44% in that scenario, which I guess comes is due to the fact that I think um, it's a much stronger win for LSE than it is for for Alabama in a way. Um, but okay. right. but what happens? Where 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 do they slot relative to like a one loss, you know, Big 12 champion right. Oklahoma, right? Where we know right. that at this point, well, actually Oklahoma I think is a very underrated team. But uh, um, what if you right. have a one loss? Pac-12, you know, champion. I mean, personally, I think they shouldn't even be in the conversation, but you know, that's <laughs> that, that's what my numbers say. But uh, right, we'll, we'll see, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Rufus, let's get into some games. Uh, Penn State goes to play undefeated Minnesota on the road. Penn State's seven-point favorite at FanDuel right now. The totals at forty-eight. Uh, Minnesota has looked good recently, uh, but they also struggled at the beginning of the season. Uh, Penn State has look pretty solid. What do your numbers see and, and what do you see in this game? So I actually, this is one of the games I really like this week. I, um, and if you get plus seven on Minnesota, I, I really, really like that bet. I make the, I make the line um, Penn state minus three here. It's mm. you're right. Yeah. Minnesota. I actually just looked, looked at their schedule when I was trying to figure out why um, I was so wrong on them. And I was like, wow, they've really squeaked by some bad teams here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, they beat South Dakota State at home by seven. You know, mm -hmm. Fresno by three in overtime. They only beat Georgia Southern by three. Um, yes, they've been, they've been better recently, um, but it, but I, I think they're actually a good team. I mean, I think that we do the way we do things. We rate later on in the season a little bit higher. I mean, um, what happens more recently is more predictive. Um, it's not a huge huge difference, but I think that does make um, a difference. And and. Um, I'm also not as high on Penn State maybe as some other people are. Um, they are, I got to pull up my ratings here. Um, they are only number seven in my ratings Okay. overall. So, you know, in, in well, that game against Michigan, so the Michigan, I mean, they have, they have some quality wins, right? I mean, but again, I think they were outplayed by Michigan in um, right. in that game, even though they were up 21 nothing and, and held on uh, to win. They, they we, we had that them graded out worse there. If you look at um, if you look at the game statistically and, and weight what is weight um, weight stats by how predictive they are moving forward. So I, I think Penn, I think the big thing here is I think Penn State is a little bit overrated. 
and Minnesota. Um, I have them as the number 14 team, but obviously they're at home. So yeah, I, I think it'll be a close game and I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping the Minnesota plus seven will come in. Interesting. I like that. Let's move on here to LSU against Alabama. Obviously, the big one for this week out in Alabama. Alabama currently a six and a half point favorite. The total here is 65. And a little bit of unknown here, potentially, with Tua Tonga Vailoa. Apparently, he's splitting practice reps with Mac Jones uh, as he comes back from that ankle injury. Do you have enough faith in Tua's availability or potential lack thereof to have a good read on this game as of Wednesday, as we're talking right now? Well, I have a lot of faith in your ability to pronounce Tua's name correctly. That was really <laughs> impressive. It's a uh, lot of practice, standing in the mirror, uh, staring at myself, we're doing it over and over, yeah. So I, I, I actually lean LSU here, but you're right. It, it is one of those games where there is a big unknown. And how do you quantify the impact of Tua? I was I was talking with um, with Jeff about this actually earlier today. And, and Tua, the value of Tua is not... the. I guess to his value on an Alabama team is not nearly as much as it would be on a lesser team um, because Alabama is just so good all around. They're a very physical team. They probably have the best wide receiver core in football. Uh, they can win without, and, and you, you look at their run the last decade, they've won generally without a dominant quarterback. And you know, who, who's, who's the last starting quarterback in, from Alabama that's made it in the NFL really? I mean, AJ McCarron is still hanging on. I think he's on yeah. Houston's roster right now. Greg McElroy lasted like a year and a half, maybe, with the Jets. Yep. Uh, I, I think it's got it's probably McCarron, yeah. McCarron. Hey, he actually got traded for something. So that's that's, that's like true. success story <laughs> for an Alabama quarterback. But <laughs> but I don't know. Like I, I, I do I do not know what that difference is between Tua and Mac Jones. I have um, you know, I can look at the recruiting numbers, I can look at I, I have a I have an estimate in general based on a player's experience level in recruiting, and I can sort of say this is, you know, a point estimate um, or the mean of a distribution of possible uh, adjustments for this quarterback. But it, it is a pretty big unknown, and so uh, the fact that I lean LSU as it is now, kind of, it, which is sort of assuming to a plays, um, would almost indicate that if you know if if you think that there's any a decent chance to a doesn't play, right. that's probably a good bet. I actually was able to buy um, to plus seven and a half for a little bit, um, plus seven and a half minus one thirty. Only buy on on or off the seven if it's ten cents. Kids, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, so I, I lean LSU there. All right, let's move on here to Iowa State at Oklahoma. Oklahoma here is a 14-point favorite. The total in this game is 68. And you alluded to Oklahoma before. And I think that they're a very interesting team because they do have that loss to Kent State, or to Kansas State. <laughs> Not Kent State, Kent State. Be a really bad loss. That'd be a beautiful, uh, terrible loss. But the remaining schedule is tough. So let's talk broadly about Oklahoma before we dive into this game specifically. They're at number nine in the initial rankings. What do your analytics say about their odds to still make the playoffs here? So I think they're very. I, I think that they're way underrated by the market. I mean, I think you can bet them at twenty-one to one right now. Futures, I have them as fourteen to one. There's more than a fifty percent chance that they control their own destiny. So I guess that's not completely controlling your own destiny. Right. But but if they win out, I think that I have them um, as a a fifty-three point eight percent chance of making the playoffs. So base. So I guess basically a coin flip. But I still think that there's sixty percent chance to win out. So I have them uh, with a one in three chance, thirty-three point four percent to make the playoff. The big thing is I think that they're just a they're a very very good team. I think they're kind of they're. Uh, I don't think they're getting quite the credit that they deserve for that. They obviously are not a, a powerhouse on defense. That's nothing new for Oklahoma. But uh, I'd rather have a great offense and a I'd rather have the number two offense and the number 21 defense than say have the number 22 defense and the number three offense. And by the way, that's Oklahoma and Auburn. Um, <laughs> so it's offense I in mean, general. There's a, there's a bigger spread between teams. Um, generally, I haven't looked at this season in particular, but in general um, there is a bigger spread in, in, in offensive talent, I guess, or offensive performance than, than defensive. Yeah, I mean, I think Oklahoma having a top 25 defense, which is something my numbers support as well, that's got to be an ecstasy for Lincoln Riley, uh, <laughs> given how they've been uh, over the last couple of games. Are, are you on a side in this game? Um, I I actually am, but not at 14. I, I was or not at, mm -hmm. I was able to get Oklahoma a little bit earlier at, at minus 13 and minus 13 and a half. And and by the way, talking about that Kansas State loss, I don't know if you Ed, I'm sure you you dove into the numbers, but 
I mean, Oklahoma actually outplayed Kansas State yeah. in that game. I think their it's, win expectancy based on the box score in that game was like 65% or somewhere in there. It was it was high. I remember yeah. looking through in the middle of the fourth quarter and, and seeing that Oklahoma was averaging more than 10 yards per play. I was like, <laughs> right. they just, they weren't getting the third down stops and they had a few costly turnovers. Yeah. Like no, I mean, that's pl- what A few plays here and there, right? A few plays made a huge difference. Yeah, and but I mean, Rufus, don't you think that's the kind of thing that kind of leads to value sometimes, right? When the final score isn't indicative of what happens, people don't dig into the underlying numbers, they don't steal the stuff off your computer of, you know, your <laughs> grades. Um, I mean, that's how you get value sometimes, right? I completely agree. But one thing that we're also ignoring in this conversation is that Oklahoma was playing from behind, so. You know, sure. I, 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 a huge part is contextualizing things, and so Oklahoma, um, you know, when they when they were down, what what were they down? They were down twenty something, twenty four. Is it twenty four? Yeah, they had a couple onside kicks uh, at the because they had the touchdown. They had the onside kick that they recovered, but then was overturned. So I think it was a couple scores right. at least. But, oh, but think right. about this. I mean, think about this. Let's say you had the same team um, up. You know, let's say Oklahoma was up 24 rather than down 24. Um, how would your expectation of the yards per play at that point way change? It would right. go way down because they're right. Yep. And so Kansas State was not Kansas State was not trying. You know, they were not playing as if it was a tie game. They were certainly um, trying to stop Oklahoma from scoring quickly more than scoring. So, um, right. so it. I think you have to you have to consider that. But I mean, for the majority of the game, Oklahoma. Um, was not in that situation and still like was playing quite well on offense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, Rufus, you got a busy schedule, so we got to let you go in a second, but first uh, outside of those three games, any numbers you see that are advantageous on the board for week number 11 Uh, for college football. I, I like, um, I like Hawaii minus seven and a half at home against San Jose state. I've been on the fade San Jose state train for a few weeks now. Um, hasn't worked out particularly well. Uh, they they beat Army outright, and uh, I'm I, I'm not I'm blanking on who they played last week, but I remember I, I remember I lost that bet also. So I'm hoping <laughs> I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping their travels in Hawaii are not um, are, are not as successful. <laughs> yeah, that no, I think that's interesting. I mean, my numbers really like Hawaii's offense and the the Cole McDonald show. I know he's kind of a little bit of a turnover machine, but uh, uh, yeah, my numbers like that one too. Uh, yeah, Cole McDonald's so, fun because he's like erratic. Like I like watching him. He's terrifying to like have a, have a lean on because like you don't. He's kind of like college Jameis, where like you don't really know what's gonna happen, but like in a fun way, I guess. Yeah. So one more one more game I like um, is Virginia Tech is a two and a half point home dog against Wake Forest, who made an appearance in the in the college football ratings. They they cracked the top top 25 that I think they were what right around 20 but I think I mean Virginia Tech um obviously they started the season very slow they they played quite well against Notre Dame I, I didn't actually I haven't dug into this game so I don't have a lot of intelligent things to say but um <laughs> but my numbers my numbers like it at this point I mean I think people forget that priors still do matter um you know team talent yep. matters and and Virginia Tech um has a little more talent than than the level they were playing to early in the season at least yeah, uh, Wake Forest came out as number 19 in the initial rankings. Uh, Jamie Newman looked healthy last week, but uh, Virginia Tech plus two and a half at home there for Rufus. All right, Rufus, I want to let you go. I know you have a busy day for today, so thank you for swinging by and talking, modeling around uh, things that we can't control, which I think is a super fascinating subject. Really appreciate the time, and good luck in week 11. Thanks a lot, and thanks for having me on, guys. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Covering the future. All right, one final thank you is out to Rufus Peabody for swinging by and breaking down Week 11. Ed, I've I was excited for Week One of college football, but I don't think I've been excited this excited for a week of college football in like I don't remember the last time. Honestly, <laughs> I know that there was that that LSU Alabama game where it was like a, a nine three game or whatever when Brad I think Brad Wing yeah, was nice. still at LSU at yeah. that time, and like I was jacked for that one, but I think. I like offense. I know it's like it's very, very plebe of me to like offense, but I like offense. And these two teams are that. so different now than they were that I think that like my level of excitement for college football this week is like the highest it's been 
is for as long as I can remember. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great weekend. Um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I'm still waiting for word on Tua and whether he can play. Yeah. Which I, you know, I mean, I think it matters. Um, yeah. You know, he's he's going to be probably one of the top two picks. He's incredibly accurate. And, you know, LSU's defense has been looking better. So, uh, you know, I think they're going to need everything uh, to win that game. And what Rufus said is true, where the situation around Tua is so good that it does mitigate some of the effect. But it's still, obviously, an upgrade to have Tua there. I mean, anyone could throw a football to Jerry Judy and look pretty good because he's basically a running back playing wide receiver uh, with his yard after the catch ability. But it does matter still. So hopefully Tua can go because that'd be a huge bummer if he could not. But right. uh, And also, I'm from Minnesota, so like... It's been fun to follow Twitter this week with all the PJ Flex stuff, getting his extension. Minnesota could right. go on four down the stretch. So it'll be a pretty they interesting got, week. They have an easy one in there, right? I mean, they it was have Wisconsin and Penn State. But they, they play got... Northwestern, so they're clearly going to lose oh, that yeah. one. Poor they're, Northwestern. <laughs> I think they play Iowa, too. Um, yeah, so they have three tough games. And... Northwestern plays UMass, and that might be the worst game in college football history. No, come on, man. It might be I mean, the worst. UMass honestly. had to play someone else this year that is is much worse worse than that. That's true. Uh, maybe we need to get Edward Egros on uh, for the for the Northwestern UMass game so he can uh, pump his vocal podcast about terrible college football games because I would have to assume that will be included. Uh, but it's there's too much good fall, college football this week to to waste time talking about that terrible team in Evanston. So <laughs> we're going to talk more about Penn State versus Minnesota in a second. But first, Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games. Well, look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is the premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on NumberFire or at OddsFire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's dive in now to covering the future, and Ed, you want to go back to that Penn State versus Minnesota game. I think it's... (coughs) one that I have no ability to diagnose personally, so I, I was glad to get Rufus's thoughts. What are your thoughts on that game up in Minnesota? Yeah, man, I've actually been thinking about this game for a couple weeks, uh, yeah. looking at Minnesota. And always at this point of the season, you're looking for undefeated teams that the underlying metrics don't support that they're undefeated, and, and Minnesota is definitely uh, that team. Uh, when I look at success rate, uh, they're 26th on offense, 52nd on defense, you know, the one thing they are doing well is throwing the ball. Uh, so with Tanner Morgan, they're 14th in, in passing success rate. But you got to remember, you know, like I've, I've, I'm very interested in fading this team. I have been for a couple weeks and people have been like, well, they're playing better over the last couple weeks, which is fine. But you got to remember how much they struggled at the beginning of the year, the South Dakota States and the, and the Fresno States. So and, and I think Penn State is legit. Uh, they're seventh in my member rankings. Uh, same as where Rufus has them, uh, 22nd on offense and adjusted success rate, third on defense. Um, I, I think this is a really good team. I think they're going to contend for the playoff. And, um, you know, I, I like Penn State minus seven on the road here. Uh, my number has it close to nine. Uh, I already bet it this week. I'm a little flabbergasted that, like, of all games that I picked this week, it had to right. be the one that's six points off what um, my number has it almost uh, Penn State by nine. I'm a l- I-, I bet you couldn't find another game where Rufus's and I predictions are off by right. six points. And um, and there's no one else. I mean, I mean there, there couldn't be a worse person to be going against on this right. show, really. <laughs> <laughs> just Peabody, professional sports better. Uh, I have all the respect in the world for his models uh, and, and uh, you know, the betting career that he's built up. So, yeah. anyways, I did not know that when, when, I, <laughs> when I planned this. Um, but, you know, I mean, I also want to say it feels a little bit like the Maryland game, even though, you know, Minnesota's a better team than Maryland. But we thought yeah. Maryland was kind of good back then. Uh, Penn State took care of business then. I, I just don't think these two teams are on the same level. And, I think it's also interesting because – your numbers are in line with Rufus on Penn State. Uh, so, like, that makes it even more interesting to me. Uh, but I also I, I can see both sides, which is why I said I have no read on this game. So I right. I will not go either way. Uh, but I think that just seeing Minnesota face a an offense that has its starter at quarterback is a deviation for them. And 
I, I view them as being kind of an unknown. And I think the reason that Minnesota probably doesn't grade out that well from a success rate model is because they've kind of lived off of big plays this year, especially in the passing game. They lived off of big plays, but that's not always predictive of living off big plays going forward, which why it makes sense that your numbers would be a little bit lower on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, they're outside the top 25 uh, in, in, in the numbers that I use for, for my member predictions. So, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it's obviously a big game and, uh, a lot of things can happen, but, uh, I expect Penn state to, to, to win and cover. And smart to PJ flag to cash in before the schedule gets <laughs> tough. So whoever Good his week. agent is hit us up. Kudos. <laughs> Well, uh, but, I mean, I think part of it was that he got mentioned for the Florida State job, yeah, right? So big yeah. changes there. Pulling it the all plug. worked out really well. That's what I, the timing of it with Willie Taggart getting fired and uh, Minnesota being eight and zero right before a, a tough right. game. That worked out hey, really well for his pocketbook, dude. Good, good for PJ Fleck. Yeah, you know these coaches have such a volatile life. Like if he's going to get his <laughs> extension and his buyouts, like you know, hundred percent more. Good I think him. it's ten million or something like that. So I mean, that's what? that's not They're, too much in the grand scheme of. That's true. The Big Willie Ten. Taggart, like I feel bad for Willie Taggart because like the situation he entered in FSU is terrible, right. uh, and like expecting success in those conditions is so do- so tough. Right. But at least he gets a sweet little payday out of it. So you know, I yeah. guess it, it could be worse. As far as my covering the future, I want to talk about Clemson. We talked about them being a team that's interesting from a college football playoff perspective. I. Don't want to touch their spread, but I do like the over on 53 points against NC State. And I think a lot of it uh, is because Clemson could put up that number all by themselves. They've been they've struggled so far this year, but some of that has been injury related. They had Trevor Lawrence apparently hurt his shoulder earlier this year. Justin Ross missed a game. He he was active, but he didn't play in that game. And Amari Rogers didn't play in the opener. And they had a bye in early October. The injuries to both Ross and Rogers happened early on, and that bye may have allowed them to get a little bit healthier. If we look in the four games since that bye, Trevor Lawrence, uh, his adjusted yards per attempt is 11.2, which is a very good number. 12 touchdowns compared to just three picks, so he's kind of cut down in the interceptions, which was a major problem for Clemson earlier in the year. NC State is ranked 46 defensively if you look at Bill Connolly's SP, SP Plus rankings. So they're not awful, but Florida State is also just outside the top 50 there. Clemson put up 45 on them. And anecdotally, like if Clemson feels disrespected by being fifth in the, in the committee and being out of the playoff at this time, we could see them try to hang a big number here and blow this game out. They're fifth in the standings, so they would be fine if they went out, but it's not as if things are super comfortable uh, for them right now. The spread is 32. I think that's high enough where I don't really have a desire to touch it. But with a total of 53, I can buy in. Number Fire projects Clemson to score 48 points by themselves in this game. So if they uphold their end of the bargain, I would bet this game goes over pretty easily. The algorithms at Number Fire have it hitting the over 79% of the time, which is Probably a little bit high, I would say, but I'm not going to turn it down when it is that high. So the total opened here at 53 and a half, and it's actually gone down half a point. So it might not be one where you have to bet it right now. You might actually get it down to 52 and a half. It's actually 53 and a half still at some books if you look at odds fire. But I do like this game to go over 53. Ed, what about you? Any thoughts on Clemson versus NC State, whether it be the spread or the total? Yeah, I mean, I'm continually impressed with what Brent Venables does on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, their their defense has just been so consistently good. Uh, you know, nothing new this year. Right. Uh, top 10, uh, I mean, top two in yards per play, adjusted for schedule there. Um, and man, North Carolina State's, I, I just looked at, I, I haven't really been following this team, but man, their, their offense numbers look awful. Yeah. Like, literally. Um, so... Uh, my model says 57 points, so definitely on the side that you'd be on. 57 points despite respecting Clemson's defense and hating NC State's offense. So I will take that for sure. Uh, so that's what we have for this week. And again, it should be a pretty fun week. I'm pretty excited to see how things play out. Um, you know, I think that it's interesting from a betting perspective, but also just as, as a college football fan, it should be a really fun week across the board. Ed, anything you want to plug here before we close up shop and get to the NFL podcast next week or tomorrow? I yeah. Say. Yeah. I mean, go sign up for my free email newsletter. You get a sample of uh, my predictions 
usually say for paying members of the site. I uh, looked at some success rate stuff last week, and I guess I promised that more of that this week. So I guess I have to fill <laughs> that. Um, I don't know, maybe some college football playoff numbers too. So uh, I try to put some good stuff in there. Uh, it's not on the site. You got to sign up for the email, email newsletter. Go to thepowerrank.com. Yep, you can sign up for that there and get that and follow Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes on Twitter, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast to get our DFS podcast, which goes up on Thursday. And the number five daily fantasy podcast feed and our NFL podcast will go up on covering the spread on Thursday as well. So make sure you are subscribed to get that and rate and review the podcast while you are there. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald for running the video side of things here today. As always, thank you, Cal, and a thank you to Rufus Peabody for swinging by and breaking down Week 11 of college football and talking about those initial rankings. Thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. We'll be back at you tomorrow to break down Week 10 of the NFL and get some thoughts on that one Joe Ostrowski. We'll break it down then and talk to you tomorrow. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Thank you.